Some materials, like glass, let a lot of light pass through them and reflect only a little. Other materials, like polished metals, reflect most of the light that strikes them and let only a little through. In glass and other materials that don't reflect much light, electrons can vibrate only over small atomic distances. In metals, some electrons, the so-called conduction electrons, can vibrate over distances much larger than the size of an atom. When light strikes glass head-on, with zero angle of incidence, about 4% is reflected and 96% transmitted. On a polished metal surface, it can be the other way around, with more than 90% reflected. The polished frying pan, held by my dear friend Charlie Spiegel, approaches 90% reflection. But never 100%. Find a surface that will reflect 100% of incoming light, Patent it, and you'll find fame and fortune. Just how the different vibration properties of electrons leads to such different reflection properties is beyond the scope of our discussion here. The interesting thing, though, is that whether a lot is reflected or only a little, and no matter what the reflecting surface is made of, the light obeys the same simple law of reflection if the surface is smooth. The law of reflection is... The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. The blue arrow represents a light ray. Instead of measuring the angles of incident and reflected rays from the reflecting surface, it's customary to measure angles from a line perpendicular to the plane of the reflecting surface. This imaginary line is called the normal. The incident ray, the normal, and the reflected ray all lie in the same plane. Such reflection from a smooth surface is called specular reflection. Mirrors produce excellent specular reflections. Here's a candle flame in front of a flat mirror. We call a flat mirror a plane mirror. Rays of light radiate from the flame in all directions. I'm showing only four of the infinite number of rays leaving one of the infinite number of points on the candle. These rays diverge from the candle flame and encounter the mirror where they are reflected at angles equal to the angles of incidence. The rays diverge from the mirror and appear to emanate from a particular point behind the mirror. An observer sees an image of the flame at this point. The light rays don't actually originate from this point, so the image is called a virtual image. The image is as far behind the mirror as the object is in front of the mirror. An image and object have the same size. Consider Blinky Bill, who wishes to view his full-length image in a mirror. We'll see that his distance from the mirror is the same as the distance of his image, which to him looks like his twin. Both Blinky Bill and his twin are of the same size, with a mirror directly between them. This brings up an interesting question. What is the minimum height for the mirror to show Blinky Bill's full-height image? If you're not familiar with the answer, get ready for a surprise. First of all, Blinky Bill is in an illuminated room, so zillions of light rays reflect from all points on his body. We'll focus our attention only on rays reflecting from his shoes, then from his hat. Of the zillions of rays reflecting from his shoes, we'll consider only one, the green ray that gets to the mirror and then reflects to his eye. This ray meets the mirror halfway between Blinky's eye and his feet. Rays in other directions would reach below, above, or off to the side of his eyes. Let's look at light from his hat that reaches the mirror. Of the many possibilities, only this ray will reflect from the mirror to Blinky's eye. What does Blinky Bill see? The lower ray extends to his twin's feet. To Blinky Bill, light from his twin's feet is what reaches his eye. Likewise with light from his hat, which appears to come from Blinky Bill's twin. If Blinky Bill is six feet tall, how tall is the part of the mirror that provides a full height image? Can you see it's three feet? This makes sense. He looks halfway down the mirror to see his feet, and halfway above eye level to see his hat. Halfway down and halfway up, that's three feet. So you only need a mirror half your height to view a full-length image of yourself. Is this wild or not? Yum physics! 
ask this question to your friends. Then ask this question. How does distance from the mirror affect the size of the mirror needed? When I ask these questions in class, I never give the answer on the same day. I'm a bit uncomfortable with this screencast, for I might not have your attention in a day or two. So I'm afraid the value of thinking on your own is somewhat diminished here. Yuck, not yum. So I won't cite the answer to the distance part of my question. Chat about this with your friends. If your friends say, who cares, find new friends. And since this lesson is on reflection, you know that who you are is in a large part a reflection of the friends you have. You're fortunate if you get to choose your friends. Another thing about mirrors. Some of your friends might ask why a mirror reverses left and right. But does a mirror really reverse left and right? Here's my sister Marjorie in front of a mirror. As you can see, her left-right axis is no more reversed than her up-and-down axis. The axis that is reversed is front-back. And note another thing. The color of her clothing in the mirror is the same. Evidence that reflection doesn't change the frequency of light. When a mirror is curved, the sizes and distances of object and image are no longer equal. I'll not discuss curved mirrors, except to say that the law of reflection, in a way, still applies. A curved mirror behaves as a succession of flat mirrors, each at a slightly different angular orientation. At each point, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Note that for a curved mirror, unlike a plane mirror, the normals at different points on the surface are not parallel to one another. When light is incident on a rough or granular surface, it's reflected in many directions. This is called diffuse reflection. If the smoothness of the surface is such that the distances between successive surface elevations are less than about one-eighth the wavelength of light, there is very little diffuse reflection and the surface is said to be polished. The wire mesh dish is very rough for light waves and so is hardly mirror-like. But for long wavelength radio waves, it is polished and therefore an excellent reflector. Reflection off the walls of your room is a good example of diffuse reflection. The light reflects back to the room but produces no mirror images. Unlike specular reflection, diffuse reflection does not produce a mirror image. Light reflecting from a roadway is diffuse. You wouldn't want the road to be so smooth it acts like a mirror, especially when driving at night. But when the road is wet, diffuse reflection is less, making the road more difficult to see. It's nice that most of our environment is seen by diffuse reflection. The blue water seen here is due to reflection of the blue sky. To see that it's true, here's what the water looks like when the sky is overcast. Yum to the physics of reflection. I want to leave you with a question. If you look at yourself in a handheld mirror and want to see as much of your face as possible, in which of these three positions should you hold the mirror? A, B, or C? Or do all positions show the same amount of your face? Try it and see. Until next time, good energy. Mm -hmm.